Hey, how are you all doing? Good, Good to see you tonight. Uh, so yeah, we're starting a new series. Um, this is Missions Month, so October 27th, Missionary First Party, don't miss it. It's your opportunity to part with your hard-earned money to get a whole lot of junk that you'll never use, that'll fill up your flats and houses. And uh, But uh, there's Christmas cakes, which are extraordinarily over, overpriced, like you might pay three or four hundred bucks for a Christmas cake, so you get to enjoy it. So Missionary First Party, um, so normally we do some messages around missions, and normally, you know, you focus on the missionaries, the guys and the guys and girls, women or that, that are out front doing the mission stuff, but we thought this year we'd do something a bit different because behind every successful missionary uh, is often a big support team, right, and people that are doing unseen jobs that make it possible for missionaries to be on the field, uh, for Christian workers to be on the field, and that without those support workers, uh, the missionaries wouldn't be able to be successful in the field. So we're focused on, focusing on support people, so we've kind of chosen three support pe- supporting people in the Bible. Uh, uh, to focus on. They happen to be Old Testament. No trick in that. It's just what we chose. It's called Secret Service because uh, they serve, but in secret you don't see them, but they're really, their work is really vital. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, tonight we're going to be in Genesis 24, so get ready to go there when I tell you because uh, it's a really cool story. Um, but, you know, it's uh, math season again, eh, on TV. Do you know what I mean? Like uh, married at first sight. And having wasted a lot of my life watching that rubbish, I decided this season that I wasn't going to do it. But it's just irresistible, eh? I mean, it's, and so it's been a massive fail on my part. I try to keep my, like my viewing down, but then it's on stuff, and it's like, oh, dude. And so you just, you, you know, you kind of you catch up. There's a writer, Brittany Stewart, in, in Australia, and she's been kind of writing about, ooh, about maths. And she kind of says it's a fever. Then she said, no, it's really an addiction. She kind of says it's like a sugar rush of reality TV. You kind of binge and then you have to purge, you know. But she reckons that like it's going to be like Shakespeare in a few hundred years because one of the things that Shakespeare did was introduce these terms into our vocabulary, you know. We for our, oh, I don't know, I can't remember. Uh, no, um, oh, no, no. <laughs> Someone give me a Shakespeare. Oh, that's the one. I was going to say Othello, but that's like wrong, right? So tell, tell how good I am at English. Anyway, um, where was I? Oh, yeah, Shakespeare. So she reckons, it's like, Married at First Sight is going to be like Shakespeare because we've got these new terms like um, um, having your partner's back or not having your partner's back, committing to the experiment, right? New terms in our vocabulary, isn't that cool? Um, laying a solid foundation, right? So, yeah. What you don't know, though, is that actually math started in the Bible. And I think my You know, my thing with maths is because it's biblical. It's my spirituality flowing through. Um, Because what we're going to see is actually a maths example, Married at First Sight Bible style, because uh, actually it happened, right? A a girl met a guy for the first time, had never met each other before and got married like right there and then, married in the biblical sense, which is, you know, they know each other. You know what? That means, eh? Basically, that's what happened, right? Then they got married. So it's pretty cool. And, like, it's a pretty important matchup because, because without this matchup, actually, Jesus Christ wouldn't have come into the world. Israel, the Jewish nation, wouldn't have happened. And so it was a pretty important math event uh, in the history of mankind. So, essential stuff. So, basically, and it involves really an unnamed person. So, an unnamed person. Did the, did the deal, put the two parties together that had never known each other before, and we don't even know really what this person's name was. But he, he did this amazing kind of thing, and in fact, he's a bit of a hero in the Scripture, even though he's just a support act. And there's a couple of um, Bible writers, one Bob Deffenbauer from Bible.org, he says this, this devotion of this servant to his master and to his master's God is one of the highlights of this chapter, Genesis 24. His piety, prayer life, and practical wisdom set a high standard for believers in any age. So the dude's pretty clever. Another guy, an academic, Bob Utley, says this is uh, one of the most godly, beautiful, faithful, supporting actors named or mentioned in the Bible. So this is a pretty amazing guy. So what's happening? Where are we going to be in, when we're in Genesis 24? It's 1900 B.C., 4,000 years ago. Abraham, you know who Abraham is, right? You all good? Yep. So Abraham was married to? Sarah, very good. You guys are good. Uh, she's died three years. Right? Abraham's about 140. Moses says advanced in age, getting on, which is really good news for me because uh, that means I'm really young. And um, anyway, uh, he's still got 35 years left. He doesn't know that. Uh, problem. 
His son Isaac's 40, no wife. Classic math situation, right? Needs to be resolved. So, yeah, yeah. So, of real concern to Abraham, he's got to get something done. All right, so Genesis 24, when you turn there on your device, we're going to be flicking in and out. It's like 67 verses, so we can't do them all tonight. But I encourage you to read it. Take you five minutes, right? Or look it up online. Someone will read it to you if you're that way inclined. It'll take eight minutes. All right, um, where are we? Genesis 24. So it starts out like this. Abraham was a very old man, and the Lord... And by the way, there's some pretty average um, sort of pictures coming up in the PowerPoint, you'll live with it, right? It's the best I could do. Um, where was it? Abraham now is a very old man, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. Verse number two. One day Abraham said to his older servant, the man in charge of his household, take an oath by putting your hand under my thigh. I swear to the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not allow my son to marry one of these local Canaanite women. They were in Canaan land, which is where Israel eventually settled, but they hadn't driven the inhabitants out. The Canaanites were there, not great, the woman, bit loose, so not what Abraham wanted, right? So verse number four, go instead to my homeland, to my relatives, find a wife for my son Isaac there. The servant asked, but what if I can't find a young woman who is willing to travel so far from home? Should I then take Isaac there to live among the relatives in the land you came from? No, Abraham responded, be careful never to take my son there. For the Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and my late native land, solemnly promised to give this land to my descendants. He will send his angel ahead of you, and he will see to that you will find a wife there for my son. If she is unwilling to come back with you, then you are free from this oath of mine, but under no circumstances are you to take my son there. So the Canaanites were loose. Uh, Abraham's hometown, they were idolatrous. That's right, eh? Idolatrous. So he's kind of not keen on that either, plus he's God's promise, all that kind of stuff. So the servant, oh, the servant took an oath, putting his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham. He swore to follow Abraham's instructions. Now, the putting the hand under the thigh thing, right? You're wondering what that's all about. Right? So, it's, so it is what you are thinking. And thigh is not really thigh. It's actually what you're thinking. Uh, so most scholars agree on this. Uh, even the, the Jewish ones in particular say, yep, they grabbed it. Right? Which sounds weird, I know. But that's what happened. So the Bible's exciting, eh? It's like, whoa, man, really? Uh, uh, so, like... Don't try that on me, any of you dudes. It won't, be good. It won't end well, right? But So why, why do they do that? Well, basically, because it's kind of involving family, descendants, you know, there's a linkage. You know, you can get that, right? And because it's kind of a really important thing, for some reason, they reached underneath and grabbed them. So that's just how they did business in those days. I mean, you know, another place, in order to cut a deal to do a contract, they, they got these animals, cut them in half, and walked between them. So... Go figure, right? Human culture. Anyway, that's what's happening with that. So, should we just move on from that? Is that good? All the girls are going, yeah, man, get a move on. All right. <laughs> so, so, Abraham is on the hunt for a wife for his son, Isaac. And so, he sends his senior servant um, to find a wife. Now, we do kind of maybe know, I told you the cartoons or pictures weren't great, but you'll live. Um, uh, we kind of have guessed that this is Eliezer, who is uh, the senior servant in Abraham's house. We know from chapter number 15, that's what his name was. That's who we assume it is. That's who we're going to call it tonight, because it's probably the closest thing uh, we're going to get to. Abraham's relatives live in northern Mesopotamia. Uh, they're a bit idolatrous, but they do know the Lord, and they're reasonably respectful. They've got some morals, so that's why Abraham wants a son for his, um, his son Isaac. Now, we thought maths was hard, right? But, man, this is really hard. Eliezer has got to go to a country he's never been before. He's got to find a girl somehow uh, that he's never met before. He's got to convince her to leave home and go m marry a guy she's never met before. Um, uh, it's just hard, right? I mean, the minor 10 kids would say she's a pretty big job. And that's what we're going to say tonight. So, and, and what this chapter, this is an interesting chapter because this chapter is about how do you go about a hard thing like that, right? How do you go about a hard mission like the one that's in front of Eli Eliezer? And um, in fact, this, this uh, chapter uses the word success six times. It uses the word success more times in this chapter than any other place in the Bible. So this is a chapter about success. How do you do something that's hard? How do you get success when you're a child of God, when you know God, and you're endeavoring to do something hard, like losing weight, 
like uh, giving up junk food, like um, shifting flats, like tidying the flat, right? Um, finding a job, uh, starting a new ministry, finding a life partner, right? That's tricky. So this, this chapter is about how you successfully do that. So it's a very kind of practical chapter. And so like there's lots of stuff in here. I reckon I can get away with six tonight, kind of just rapid fire, bang, 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 bang. Uh, so we're going to do six, and then I'll tell you a story at the end. So first thing, how do you go about something that's hard? What can we learn from this example of the support person in the scripture? So the first thing is to be really clear about your goal really clear about the thing you want to do. Know exactly what you need to do. And so Abraham told Eliezer this, verse number four, go instead to my homeland, to my relatives, and find a wife for my son Isaac there. Really clear, really specific. Um, And he then sort of gives some other conditions as we move on in the chapter. We see that he also said, yes, you must find a wife for my son among my relatives from my father's family. So he narrows it down. But it's really specific. The other thing was he told him what he could not do, right? So he said, uh, verse number three, you will not allow my son to marry one of those local Canaanite women. We've explained that. Be careful never to take my son there to the land that I came from. Under no circumstances are you to take my son there. So go get a wife. Don't do this. Don't do that. Um, And then he was also really clear about when the task was over, when it was ended, when he could let it go. If she is unwilling to come back with you, then you are free from this oath of mine. The point is, uh, when you're setting out to do something amazing for God or amazing in your life, amazing for you, be really specific, be really clear, have a really clear goal. Now, most of us struggle with vagueness, right? We're vague. We have vague goals, and that's why we struggle sometimes to reach those goals because they're so vague. You know, there's an industry of Christian life coaches. Imagine that. Uh, But uh, amazing, eh? Imagine making a living doing that. I reckon that's... I won't go any further. Um, but they do say that one of the things they struggle with, with the people they meet with, is just they're so vague about their stuff, you know, what they want to do. So try and be specific. That's the first thing. Second thing is the coolest thing. And, you know, normally when you're in a passage, something kind of jumps out of you. This was the thing for me that jumped out in this passage. And that is, number two, recognize that God goes ahead of us. I just love this in verse 7b. He will send his angel ahead of you, and he will see to you to it that you find a wife there for my son. Then later on in the chapter, verse number 40, the Lord in whose presence I have lived will send his angel with you and make your mission successful. That is so cool. And actually, one of the things we know from the scripture that is that God does send his angel before us, in front of us, ahead of us sometimes, and kind of make the make the way clear, open up the path, enable us to do stuff. Now, the thing for us is that we never see that. It's in the other dimension, you know, that we can't see yet. We will see it one day. It will be very cool, but we can't see it. But it doesn't mean that it's not true, that sometimes God has gone before us with his angels, and the Bible is very clear that angels are here to help us, believers. Hebrews talks about it a lot. It's a New Testament thing. We don't see them, but they're there. And I think it's so cool that God goes in front of us sometimes, and I think we forget that when we're embarking on something, but we can have confidence in that, that God is going before us. And so this is what Abraham promised Eliezer in this chapter. Recognize that God goes ahead of us. And then the third thing tonight is to pray for success, to pray for success. So it says in verse number 10 that then he loaded uh, 10 of Abraham's camels with all kinds of expensive gifts from his master and traveled to distant Aram Naharaim, something like that. Uh, Then he went to the town where Abraham's brother Nahor had settled. He made the camels kneel beside a well outside the town. It was evening, and the women were coming to draw water. And and this is what he prayed. He said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success today and show show unfailing love to my master Abraham. Please give me success today. One of the things in the story, if you read the whole chapter, is that this servant, this support person, Eliezer, prayed sort of throughout this event. He had prayed before he met the girl. He prayed when he meets the girl because he's going to meet the girl. He prays before her family. So he's just like, a, a do that praise, right? And praying when you're trying to achieve something uh, is really important. And it demonstrates how much desire we have. You know, how much prayer we do demonstrates how badly we want it. Now, Jesus in the gospel said, pray uh, relentlessly, 
over and over, really go at it. And I would say to you, the strength of your desire for the things you want to do will be measured by how much prayer you undertake about that thing. Right? So that's the first thing. The second thing it demonstrates is who we're depending on. Like sometimes I don't pray for stuff. It's like, God, I got it, right? But actually, nah, uh, it's a really important to depend on God. I was talking to someone this morning. And they said, do you pray about small stuff? I said, yeah, man, I pray about it. everything I get my hands on, right? Uh, because I want to depend on God. And I said, you know, like if I haven't prayed about it, I can't have any expectation about it. So dependency, all right, really cool. But notice that he says in verse number 12, O Lord, um, o Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success today. You know, it's actually okay to pray for success. I think we have a sense that actually that's a bit selfish and a bit sort of, you know, just sort of icky, you know, praying for success. The older I get, the more often I pray to be successful. God, I want to be successful in the things I do. Why wouldn't you pray that? What's the alternative? You pray to be a failure? Look, God, Lord, let me fail. It's like, oh, no, that's not. You know, we, we pray for success. That's one of the things we do. It's okay to pray for success. In fact, that's what he did. He prayed to be successful. Fourth thing. Uh, to acknowledge the problems. Verse number 13. See, he goes on, I'm standing here beside the spring and the young woman of the town are coming out to draw water. And in verse number five, he says, but what if I can't find a young woman who is willing to travel so far from home? The reality is, whenever you try and do stuff, there's problems, right? All kinds of problems. Uh, emotional, financial, uh, intellectual, relational. There's always problems. And when the, the greater the thing you try and do, the more problems you kind of have. Think about Ali Isa's problems. He's got to travel 800 kilometers on, on a camel to get where he needs to go. Wellington to Whangarei, right? So that's, that's a long time on a camel. You imagine doing that on a camel. He's got to go to a country he's never been before. Got to find a lady he's never met. He's got, got to convince her to go back and marry a stranger she's never met. He has to find the right girl. He has to get her parents' consent. He has to get her consent like there's a lot of problems. Now, sometimes I reckon, particularly in Christian circles, we're a bit afraid to sort of say what the problems we think there are or what the barriers to success or the obstacles that are in our way. I think we think sometimes that it sort of shows a lack of faith. But from my reading of this chapter, this guy is a pretty spiritual guy. He has no problem saying this is what I think the problems are yeah, and just identifying and acknowledging them. One of the reasons it's really important to do that is our next point, and that is because he used those problems to create a plan, and that's the fifth thing tonight, to develop or create a, pray, a plan. Verse number 14, he's continuing to pray. This is my request. I will ask one of them, one of the girls that are coming to get water, please give me a drink from your jug. If she says yes, um, have a drink, and I will water your camels too, let her be the one that you have selected as Isaac's wife. This is how I know you have shown unfailing love to my master. So this is his plan, right? This is the servant's plan. Basically, he goes to where the wells are. It's kind of evening time when they're coming to get water. He says, basically, I'm going to see some woman arrive, and I'm going to ask one of them, give me the drink. Uh, if she says, yes, you can have a drink, and also I'm going to get water for your camels as well, then she's the girl. You might say, eh, doesn't sound like much of a plan to me, except for these 10 camels, and you know how much camels can drink on average? 150 litres. So, and actually, they drink them in like minutes. Like it takes them less than five minutes to go through. I can't even imagine that. I couldn't find a vid of it. But it was like, really? Anyway, so you do the math. How many litres? Oh, you guys are pathetic. How many litres? 10 times 150. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so that's a lot of water to draw by hand, right? So, look, if she's willing to water the camels, she's got to be some kind of woman, right? I mean, that's extraordinary that she would go down and water the camels. Actually, my reading of this, I think she's just a hot, basically. Um, I want to meet her in eternity. It's just, I do, right? I think she's just a babe. And you'll see when I get there. I mean, honestly, I think she's going to, yeah, anyway. Um, I was warned this morning I shouldn't say that, but too bad. <laughs> Where were we? All right. <laughs> so he develops a plan, right? And the plan works, because we're going to go on, just read a little longer here. 
Point number six, because he gets to celebrate success and praise the Lord. Now, you see what I mean. Verse 15, before he had finished praying, he saw a young woman, woman named Rebecca come in with her water jug on his shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, who was the son of Abraham's brother Nahor and his wife Milka. Ooh, baby. Um, Rebecca was very beautiful, right family. She was very beautiful and old enough to be married, but she was still a virgin. Man, it's lining up, right? So she goes down to the spring, fills her jug, comes up again. Running over to her, verse number 17, the servant said, Please give me a little drink of water from your jug. Yes, my lord, she answered, have a drink. And she quickly lowered her jug, drug from, her, jug from her shoulder and gave him a drink. Verse 19. When she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too, too until they have had enough to drink. Eureka. It's the girl. Right. Now, I could take you through the rest of the chapter, but it's a long chapter. So let me cut a long story short. Basically, this is what happens. He asks her, whose family are you? She says, I'm the granddaughter of Abraham's brother, basically. He says, yeah. And so she invites him back to stay the night with her family. They go back. He has dinner. He tells them all about what happened and the plan and the prayer and Abraham and all that kind of stuff. They basically say, look, God seems in this. You can have our daughter, but wait 10 days. He says, no, nah, I don't want to wait 10 days. I want to go. And so they say, well, you have to ask her. So he goes up to her and says, will you come back and marry this dude, Isaac? And not that Isaac, the other one. Um, and she, uh, yeah, he's already married. Um, <laughs> ain't got a kid. Yeah, good point. Uh, basically, so she goes with him, right? And they traveled camel at 800 kilometers, Whangarei, back to Wellington. And um, uh, she just happened to be getting close to Abraham's home. Isaac's out in the field being spiritual, meditating. She says, oh, who's the dude? You know, as you do, it's mass, right? So it's like, woo. And um, uh, jumps off the camel, veils her face, goes up and meets him. And then verse number 67 says this. Isaac brought Rebekah into his mother Sarah's tent and she became his wife. He loved her deeply and she was a special comfort to him after the death of his mother mission accomplish. So great job. Successful. The thing about it is every time something good happens in this chapter, Eliezer, the servant, um, it says he bows low and worships the Lord. So he celebrates his success and he praises the Lord. How do you go about doing something hard and be successful in, in Christ Jesus? Well, I reckon at least six things, right? Be really specific about the thing you're trying to do. Recognize and realize that God goes before you. Pray for success. Acknowledge the problems, right? Create a plan, and when God gives you success, celebrate it and praise the Lord. Pretty cool example of how to do something really successful, particularly as a support person. So uh, a few months ago, I got this call from um, Pastor in Taupo, and he said, through various connections, um, I'd like you to come up and speak to our church. So I said, that's cool. So I went up in July and met the church and spoke to the church, and it was, it was pretty cool. But we stayed overnight um, in order to do that. Taupo's like three hours away. And then so he called again and said, would you come and speak again? And I said, yeah. But, and I thought to myself, ah, I'm not going to stay overnight. Um, I'll just go up in the morning, right, speak and come back, right? Like I'm 30, but I'm not 30, right? I'm like 50, so not a good plan. Anyway. So I'm like, yeah, that'll be cool. So I was telling Penny about this, married to Penny. And she said, ah, you do realize that weekend is like daylight saving weekend when they take the clocks forward. And I'm thinking, oh, dude. So it seemed like a good idea at the time. 4.15 Sunday morning seemed like a really bad idea. <laughs> no good, right? No good. And then so, you know, I get through that. I get on the road. And then I think, like, I want to be there. I'm very specific about it. I want to be there at 9. I left at 6. But line only gives me, church starts at 10, like an hour's kind of leeway. What if the car breaks down? What if I get a puncture? What if I get caught speeding? What if I, uh, no, not really, I just, you wait still. Uh, what if there's an accident? You know, what if the desert road is closed because it's in that kind of winter spring thing, you know? And I thought, oh, this is a really bad idea. And I thought, no, 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 got to, you know, got to pray for success and you know, um, acknowledge the problems and create a plan. So I did this thing with God, like, so I said, okay, God, so this is where I'll turn back and this is where I'll keep going. This is who I'll call if I have problems, right? This is what um, I'll do. And um, 
and I'm going to give it to you and, and create a, um, I want to make a success and my plan is to be there at nine and I want to have breakfast and review my message and all that kind of stuff. And like every 20 minutes, I get 20 minutes down the road and I go, oh Lord, thank you, I'm 20 minutes further, 20 minutes further. I don't know, it sounds kind of like anxiety issues, eh? But I don't know, not enough sleep, that kind of stuff. Um, but it was really cool. So Lord was good, got there at nine, had a great breakfast, paleo food, like in Taupo, I was like, man... Anyway, um, reviewed my message, got to the church, all went good. But, you know, the two things I did was when I got to Taupo, I, I just, you know, I just, I had my eyes on the road, but I was like, thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. That's awesome. When I left to go home, thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. You know, these are like six really simple steps, but they just work in, in just simple everyday stuff. Right? Um, God is a God who wants us to succeed at stuff. And this is a great example of how to succeed. The other thing I think is really cool is, I know when you think about God the Father, they just they had a goal for all of us, right? A goal to bring us into their kingdom. Yeah, and that very specific goal, and that was through the Lord Jesus Christ that He would come to Earth and He would die in our place, right? Very specific plan. And you see in the Gospels often that it says that Jesus set His face towards Jerusalem. He was He was really focused. Sometimes people would implore him to stay where he was and said, nah, I've got a job to do. Really clear job. And oftentimes we see the angels going ahead of Jesus or the Holy Spirit going ahead of Jesus and like preparing the way. I think that's so cool. We, we find Christ in prayer so often with a focus on what he needed to do and what he came for. You know, there were lots of problems. There were lots of obstacles. There were lots of things that could have gotten Christ's way. They acknowledged those. He acknowledged those. But he had a plan. They created a plan. And he was successful in his plans. Brutal, but he was successful. A great plan. A plan that affects every single one of us. It's a plan that can involve you if you want it to. It's a plan that if you're part of it already, that you can celebrate the success of God's plan because it's brought you into his kingdom. And praise the Lord. So I'm going to pray. The band's going to come. And like just for the rest of tonight, why don't we celebrate being part of God's kingdom, being part of his plan. Why don't we praise the Lord, lift him up, bow our hearts if that's what we need to do. But if you've got something you're working on, right, something big in your life or even something small in your life, you may want to just give that to the Lord and say, Lord, I just, I'm praying for success. Help me to be specific, create a plan, realize you're in front of me, acknowledge the problems, all the stuff we talked about tonight. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit of God, just as we considered Genesis 24 and kind of had some fun tonight and looked at um, Isaac, Rebecca, Eliezer, Abraham, thanks for a great example of how to do something really tough, really hard in your scripture, but to be successful at it. Lord, we're all at different places and different stages, and we've all got different stuff going on in our lives, but we just, we just thank you for this example, and we pray that we would you know, commit some of these steps in our own lives, put them before you, throw the plan up there towards you and say, Lord, I just really want to achieve this and help me to do that. Lord, we thank you that you created a plan for all of us, a plan of redemption, a plan that spans the whole of eternity. Thanks for inviting us into that plan, for making us part of that plan. Tonight, as we just kind of close out here in worship, we just want to acknowledge that plan. We want to celebrate you. We want to praise you. If we need to, we want to bow our hearts before you and and put our plans and our lives in your hands. We ask that you would just work in our hearts, stir us, your spirit would work hard, and that we would um, honor you, praise you, and live for you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.